ganz kurz äh, von uns, von Urbane Kürze Ruhe, herzlich willkommen zu diesem Wandersalon. Wir freuen uns sehr, dass wir heute hier sein dürfen im Bergbaumuseum Bochum. Ähm, ja, wir waren nämlich mit Munira Al-Kadiri tatsächlich schon mal hier ähm, als Ausflug und haben uns äh, hier die auch ganze Ausstellung und Sammlung ein bisschen angeschaut. Ähm, und dann hat Munira gesagt, oh, das ist, ich finde es so spannend hier. Ähm, und dann haben wir gesagt, wir müssen eigentlich zusammen hier einen Wandersalon machen. Ähm, ganz kurz nur ein paar Worte zu Munira. Äh, sie ist 1983 ähm, im Senegal geboren, ähm, in Kuwait aufgewachsen, ähm, hat ja einen Großteil ihrer Jugend und ihr, ihres Studiums in Japan verbracht, zehn Jahre lang dort gelebt, dann im Libanon und jetzt äh, ist sie in Berlin gelandet, <lacht> wo sie äh, immer noch ähm, wohnt. Und ähm, über ihre Arbeit kann sie, glaube ich, am allerbesten selbst äh, dann berichten. Ähm, aber ein Hinweis, ähm, Munira wird Teil äh, des Ruhe-Ding sein, in einer großen Ausstellung, die Urbane Kunst Ruhe unter der künstlerischen Leitung von Britta Peters, die hier vorne links sitzt, <lacht> gerade plant. Ähm, und schon jetzt sind alle ganz herzlich eingeladen, dann im ähm, Mai und Juni sich die anzuschauen in Herne, Recklinghausen, Haltern am See und Mahl. Und Munira wird eben eine Arbeit, über die ich jetzt noch nicht so viel verraten möchte, dazu auch beisteuern. Ähm, noch ein kurzer Hinweis, äh, hier liegen noch Karten aus für unseren nächsten Wandersalon, denn es geht ja munter weiter, wir zählen jetzt schon quasi mit dem Wandersalon den Countdown aufs nächste Ruhrding runter. Äh, und am 26.03. sind wir im langen August in Dortmund zu Gast und haben eine Kooperation mit dem Wissenschaftsladen Dortmund äh, und machen eine Gesprächsrunde zu Klima, Kunst und Digitalisierung äh, und wollen den Themenkomplex so also aus verschiedenen äh, Blickrichtungen uns mal anschauen, was für Chancen, was für Risiken gibt es eigentlich Digitalisierung ähm, für oder gegen den Klimaschutz ähm, und wie kann man das Ganze aus künstlerischer Perspektive sich anschauen. Ähm, der Vortrag von Monira wird auf Englisch sein. Ähm, wenn jemand eine Flüsterübersetzung auf Deutsch haben möchte, bitte einmal kurz melden, dann macht das jemand von uns aus dem Team. Okay, kriegen wir hin. Ähm, genau, jetzt ist die Frage, stellen wir noch das Licht äh, ein oder machen wir zwischendurch eine Pause? Du kannst mal versuchen. Ja, wollen wir es noch versuchen? Okay, dann gibt es jetzt noch ein... Ja. Ist okay. Wir versuchen es erstmal ohne. Da müssen wir jetzt nicht noch länger hinauszögern. Ja, ja. ja ist okay. Und wenn es gar nicht geht, dann gehen wir immer noch mal. Ich kann den einen Anschalter an den Licht oben von den runterlegen. Ist okay. Ja. Okay, jetzt viel Spaß. Christina, ich habe ja. noch mal eine Ansage, weil die Flüsterübersetzung war jetzt in verschiedenen Ecken und ja. eine Gruppe da bilden. So, vielleicht nochmal alle melden, die gerne eine Flüsterübersetzung auf Deutsch hätten. Mhm. Zwei Personen, können wir uns vielleicht zusammenfinden? Ja, ja. ja. Mit Plätze tauschen oder so? Hallo. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Monira Al Kadiri. I am a visual artist, and today I am going to be speaking. Um, about something that is very kind of my um, preoccupation and obsession, but also has very much a strong relationship to this place in particular. Um, so I am speaking about your past is my future. Um, my work deals a lot with um, different times, so it's almost like always time traveling between different places and times and uh, thinking about different pasts or futures and I, uh, I thought this, that being here is, is very interesting for me in, in Bochum because um, 
the, the background and history and narrative of this place is, uh, has a very strong relation to the background and history and narrative of my original, uh, <laughs> let's say, uh, origin, which is uh, Kuwait. Um, because of the uh, dependence on fossil fuels, uh, once upon a time, or let's say until 2018, um, this place was very much dependent on coal. And my region, the Gulf region, is still very much dependent on petroleum, oil. And I think about this every day as a kind of coming, impending disaster. That when it will finally, the market will crash and the world will not need oil anymore, that uh, some other type of future awaits us. Um, this is Dubai, not exactly Kuwait, <laughs> but uh, it's kind of the same uh, structure. Uh, it's desert by the sea. And actually before oil, for according to some theories, um, the main industry was uh, pearl diving, uh, and some people say that it was almost 2,000 years old, this, uh, this industry. Um, even my own grandfather uh, worked as a singer on a pearl diving boat. Boat, yes, they had a singer on the boat. And um, after the discovery of oil in the 1940s, and subsequently, I mean, this history was kind of erased, but not exactly. It was sanitized, it turned into a kind of amusement park. I would say it's uh, been Disneyfied somehow. Uh, they've erased a very important aspect of this history, which is um, poverty, because it was very much related to the only source of income was pearls, and it was a very harsh uh, job, and you know people would get sick and die in the sea. And, it was really difficult, so there was this very strong relationship to the sea. And I, um, I always think about this as a, a post-oil person, that you know, my, my grandfather is symbolized by these boats. They're fake in this fake heritage village. And uh, my kind of freak generation that will not last very long, what will be the kind of... Uh, monumental thing that people, tourists, will take pictures of. So I decided in 2014 to make this giant oil drill. It's an enlarged drill used for mining oil. Uh, very much like the, some of the drills in the basement here used to mine coal. I mean, it's all the same kind of activity, um, taking things from the ground. So I enlarged it and I, um, I turned it into a, I would say it's a self-portrait because I think um, we are kind of a, a freak, freak generation, uh, some uh, mutants and uh, we need some mutant forms to represent us. Um, the color is uh, an exploration I did between the color of pearls and oil, trying to create a relationship between them, because there isn't one. Um, so I thought the most radical thing to do is to use this color and form in, in a way that it creates a continuation in the narrative of the place, even though uh, there isn't one. There was the oil really ruptured history. Um, so yeah, I discovered that pearls have this color scheme called dichroic color, which is the same as in crude oil, and I started to make uh, works around this. Funnily enough, uh, I made this work in late 2014, and then two weeks later, the oil crash happened. And it hasn't recovered since then. Um, there's a lot of changes that are happening now because you know, the barrel of oil used to be 120, 130 dollars, and then it fell to like 40. So there is a, a huge difference in, 
in what the income was and is, is now, and I don't think it will ever recover. And I'm very happy about that. <laughs> and uh, I always start to think about the, the, uh, the drills as a, as a metaphor for the future. What if we find them a thousand years from now? Will they still be uh, seen as uh, a, a machine or as an artifact from an ancient people, you know, that they used to wear or they used to worship? So I had a dream that uh, they were, instead of drilling the ground, they were drilling the air. So I, I made them levitate and then they would drill the air. Um, I also started to imagine maybe the oil itself um, becomes totally worthless, but somebody discovers a, a therapeutic, um, you know, a worth to it, and then people start swimming in it, and it becomes more elaborate, and and then the synchronized swimming shows in, in oil at night, and uh, a lot of different scenarios started popping up in my head. Um, but now I want to, um, I want to, uh, I want to uh, show you um, a small lecture performance called Petrochemicals in Purgatory. In this life, the ghost of a dinosaur haunts us. He haunts us every single day. He hovers over our bed at night. He's in the bathroom, behind the curtains, under the table, covering our eyes and ears, hiding in the clothes we wear, riding with us on the airplane. He's listening to our phone calls, He's flashing on our screens, and if you pay attention, he's even sending messages to our minds. He has violated every existing orifice in our bodies. He breathes on us, runs with us, comforts us, sweats with us. He has inserted himself in all areas of life, but he himself is in no way alive. He exists as a body in between, inside a no-man's land, a space that cannot be recovered by the living nor the dead, the halfway point between reward and punishment, a kind of green screen life where shapes and forms are devoid of their substance and infinitely replaceable. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Essentially, he is living in the purgatory, the berzakh, Inside the berzakh, as it's called in Farsi, our bodies are in fact not made of flesh and blood. Our body becomes an elegant, fine and exquisite body, finer than air. There are no material barriers that can block it, like in this material world. The berzakh body can see anything and everything from everywhere and at every time. It observes no difference whether something is on this side of the wall or the other. But it is also a body that suffers, that cannot escape. Like a hamster trapped inside a cage, it feels pain a thousand times more powerful. It's surrounded by monsters who want to eat away at its infinite soul forever. That dinosaur purgatory is called oil. And we are the monsters that eat it. Cooked over millions of years, petroleum is said to be the soup that's made of the remains of dinosaur flesh and bones, marine creatures, plankton, and other ancient biological life forms. A descendant of the great extinction. It lay there dormant at the bottom of the earth until exactly 160 years ago, when we revived this age-old dinosaur soul from the dead 
and brought it back to life through covetous mining activities. We combusted it and released the power of that enchanting Jurassic sunlight hidden within it. And thus it became the carbon energy beast of our dreams that power our, our industrial soul. The ancient sunlight transformed into fire for heat, fire for light, and fire for fuel. Ah, petroleum, you old friend. You have been with us since the beginning. None of us were alive before you touched us with your grace. Like the monkeys of the space odyssey, we caressed you and welcomed you, and our lives and bodies were changed forever. Like a genie or a djinn, we rubbed the lamp and lo, you flew out into the world, came into being and established yourself like an all-important deity. Obeying our command, you became the arbiter of our desires, grantor of our wishes, provider of our wealth, a master of ceremonies. But just like any djinn, you are devious too, calculating and shrewd, for you plan to someday take revenge on your summoner. You will destroy us eventually by the sheer call of your destiny. No one in your path will remain unscathed. As a post-oil Kuwaiti myself, coming from a country that is completely subsumed by the oil industry, I have to confess that I have a psychological problem, an existential conundrum, a petro-historical complex. I'm tired of being a freak, of representing this freak interval in history that has morphed us into bizarre mutants. I'm tired of being an ambassador of pollution and greed. I want to wash the oil out of my body for good. But maybe if I take a bath in it, like they do in Azerbaijan, maybe if I feel the terror, the pain, the sense of awe, maybe if I smother myself with the scent of dinosaur death on my skin, I will somehow rid myself of it. Then I would reach out and spread my arms for everyone to see. Pose for the camera, causing my body to slowly but surely disintegrate, leaving only my arms outstretched into space. I would be floating, floating in deep time and deep space. I would be deep floating. Until recently, I was naive enough to think of oil only in terms of fuel. I thought if we could only replace it with alternative sources other than fossils, my country's economy would collapse tomorrow and perhaps during this mini Armageddon it would find its way on the righteous path again. It would stop its addiction to oil and get on with life. We would become a truly post-oil state in the real sense of the word. The petrodollar that has been infecting the entire region's political and historical trajectory and that of the world could finally be gone, disappear, never to return. Like its long lost brother Cole, we would finally be free, free at last. Hallelujah. But the dinosaur's plight doesn't end there, unfortunately. For he is also a transformer. He transforms and transforms and shapeshifts into many, many other things. He transmutates into plastics, rubbers, resins, synthetic fibers, adhesives, dyes, detergents, pesticides, paints, and so much more. In other words, petrochemical products. These things that we can't function without in our modern existence. They envelop us completely. They're used to make the bedspread on your bed, the carpeting on your floor, the paint on your wall, and the curtains on your windows. They are all the materials that create comfort and efficiency. Foam insulation and vinyl siding, and all that fake green grass. Even when you go out for a drive, know that your car is littered with petrochemicals within every nook and cranny. Petrochemicals. 
They are the dinosaur that haunts us. They will never leave us, even if we try to escape. They will appear at every turn like a cheap horror movie. Sometimes I wonder, is this what the dinosaurs died for? Did their bodies melt in a meteoric cataclysm with a space asteroid that killed them all in a terrible, magnificent apocalypse? In order to meet their destiny millions of years later as the future harbingers of com comfort for the human race, that they will overrun the Earth again using a different body, the plastic body, the body that does not die but floats, floats forever on the high seas, choking other life forms, creeping into their esophaguses and stomachs, destroying, annihilating en masse, like they were once annihilated. Is it the dinosaur's divine revenge from beyond the purgatory? Did they purposefully sacrifice their bodies to get here? Sometimes I wonder what our post-apocalyptic bodies will look like. Maybe soon, maybe this year, it will be our turn to become like the dinosaurs. On one fateful day, a giant pitch black meteor will hurtle suddenly towards Earth. It will collide with the planet and in one fell swoop will wipe out all the humans and land-dwelling creatures. Only the ocean dwellers will survive. The trauma and pain is so overwhelming that none of us can rec ever recover. So we surrender, we die. Our bodies and bones and blood are absorbed by the earth. We become part of the soil, mixing into a soup with many other creatures. That soup is cooked over the ages until we, like the dinosaurs, morph into some other material or substance. Like the genie waiting inside the lamp, someone will summon us from beyond the purgatory some advanced alien life form. They will use our decomposed flesh and bones to give them comfort, to cool them down, to sanitize their surroundings, to make sense and sprays out of us. Or maybe we have a distant, distant, different destiny than all of this. Maybe we will regress, perhaps go back in time to shapeshift into a different ancestral form. A long, long time ago, maybe I was an octopus, this 300 million year old creature who has seen so much in its lifetime, stretches its arms out into the world like I once did. It floats in the ocean, changing its body and form constantly. Its arms are part of its brain, tentacles of thought and intelligence. I wonder, in that octopus form, did I have a memory? And was that memory divine? We are behind the sun now, the final moments of Earth after the great apocalypse, when the Earth belched fire like the classic image of hell or as Werner Herzog tried once to capture it. Only he was lying because it already happened once. Once in Kuwait, 30 years ago.
أبدع الكون العجيب بصنعي فنظام فيما نرى سليم هذا النهار مع الظلام تعاقب أبدا فذا يمضي وذاك يقيم فالليل يجلوه الضياء كما تشاء وإذا أبيت فليلنا سيد والصبح تنسجه الغزالة باسيا فإذا الدنا أغرودة ونعيم والشمس يسفر حسنها حتى إذا ولت أضاءت في السماء نجوم فالشمس تجي فالشمس تجي لا يؤخر سيرها شيء لا كالسابحات مضى والبدر يسري مثل ما تبغي له له في السماء منازل وديار والنجم والنجم يسبح في الفضاء كما تشاء ويمير للسارين وهو مضار كم مجرات وأفلاك لتسعى في فضاء الكون ذرات تغور قوان قد هاب حول الأرض عشق فهو البطحاء للخلق السبيل وبذور تزداد الجوزاء منها والجور سطعت تاتي تنير وبحار يعلم المولى مداء وكنوز في الحماء لا تبور والزهر يفضح روضه ارج فيجيبه من فور النحل ويعطر النحل البديع شرابا فاذا الثغور لرشفه تشتاق وتمخض الارض الولود اطالبا تهنى بطيب مذاقها الاشتاق والنهر والنهر اطلق ماء يروي الثرى فإذا النبات بساقه عملاق والماء يجري والماء يجري سلسلا بردا متراخيا ونافست الورود بديعه فالقلب في دنيا الجمال محير
كل تمتع من عطاء ناله وتنوع الارزاق والاذواق لو أن أشجار الوجود تقلمت ومدادها ماء الدنا المعلوم لو أن ربك زاده من أبحر مددا يجيء بخلقه القيوم نفد المداد ومدت كلمات Now the apocalypse is over and we have regressed and mutated into a heavenly octopus. I'm not the only one.
فأي براءة وجبت بحي ليجمع ضحكه والدمع قبله فطفلك من كنوز الارض اغلى فهيا للمكارم اسقنا وعلمه الفضائل والمعاني فما يأس مرون إن صار طفلا It's, they're all like symbolic, almost metafictional uh, things. Uh, there's theories that the petroleum is made of little different, you know, different things. So there's this dinosaur is a symbol of all those kind of dead things that we revived um, in a different way. And I just thought it was interesting to use it as a as a metaphor for this. Um, this kind of terrifying giant animal, uh, and suddenly it's it's uh, it's you know it's made making shampoo in your hair. <laughs> I think it's it's just very ironic and strange and interesting how these things happen. Um, the octopus is a is a kind of a different thing. I'm always thinking about the after after the world ends, do we transform our consciousness into another being? Um, it's, it represents like a state of peace to me somehow. Um, I don't know, that's something I don't have an answer for, but I just feel like it's, it's, a, it's a divine being that maybe is um, somewhere near us in the afterlife. Also another point about the octopus, is because uh, of this uh, ideas about pearl diving and always thinking about the world that my grandfather saw. You know, maybe he was swimming underwater and he used to see these like they were uh, these creatures like they were his friends or something. And if you're in the sea for six or nine months in a year, you must befriend ocean dwellers that we don't usually deal with. <laughs> Um, so yeah, just a lot of these different ideas together, but it's fiction and, and symbolism mostly. Mm. Maybe you can tell us a bit more about um, the end of pearl diving mm -hmm. and the beginning of oil, mm -hmm. and also about the actual situation in Kuwait, how much people reflect that oil might end mm -hmm. or that uh, all these things because for, for us, it's very far away, you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the, the um, let's say, pop, popular or, uh, yeah, the, the national consciousness about it is um, not really, uh, people don't really think about the ending of it. Um, but somehow there is always a plan B People are always thinking that maybe something will happen in the back of their minds, but in general discourse, it's not really spoken about. Um, uh, the state tries to pretend that it's a kind of a magic potion that 
you know, God bestowed upon us and uh, makes everybody wealthy, but um, it's, it's also very much concealed. The oil industry is not like you can just go there and uh, you can't just go to an, you know, an oil field and take pictures and, you know, do some tourism. It's not allowed, even for locals. So it's very much concealed in, in the background. Uh, they say this is for security reasons, but I think it's more than that. It's, it's that you don't associate your current self with this industry, because if you do, immediately it becomes uh, fragile and, um, yeah, uh, yeah, it, it can collapse at any moment. And um, Kuwait is 90% dependent on oil, so it's much even worse situation, I think, than the neighboring countries because there is really no plan after it. <laughs> and so it's, we're living in the moment. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, I think it's an interesting situation. Um, uh, but it creates this, for me, uh, existential crisis all the time. I mean, I, I don't live from it. I, I don't have any association with it personally. But, but um, you know, we live in the modern world. And, and what if uh, Kuwait ceases to become a state tomorrow? And what happens to me? And you're always thinking about these things because um, it's, it's almost like it's a, s a state, but at the same time, it's a corporation. And uh, if, uh, like coal, uh, petrol becomes obsolete, um, things will change very dramatically, very quickly, I think. And uh, it's something I always deal with in my work, because I always want to put it in the past, even though it's still in the present. But I always want to jump in the future to see what it's, going to be in a hundred years, two hundred years, you know, a thousand years, or before, or it's always uh, this kind of uh, trying to free myself from it. Yeah. <laughs> Did I answer your question? Yes, the pearl diving, yeah. To uh, oil, we also kind of um, hard edge change, but like, what's the There was no soft, no. Um, movement from one, um, no, obviously everybody dropped the pearl diving yeah. at, the, at the drop of a hat because it was very difficult, uh, very harsh work and oil was providing easy money for everyone. So everybody like one day yeah, immediately forgot about it. They kept the songs and the music and this kind of boats and stuff as a kind of uh, token of, of heritage and history, but it's not real anymore. Like, it doesn't have any weight, historical weight. It's, uh, it's almost like a prop. Like, I, I always, I've never met my grandfather, and I always feel like his, his life is a fiction that somebody dreamt of in a, in a PR office somewhere. <laughs> I don't even think it's real, you know? How did they do that? It must be, you know, must be a fiction. <laughs> Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I think it's so interesting the idea of putting things in the past. I mm -hmm. think if you put things in the past, you can sort of recontextualize them this. already, even though they were months ago. So I think I was, I was wondering if that is why, I mean, how did you place the, the, the statue, mm -hmm. I guess, of the, the drill? Mm -hmm. the drill. Mm -hmm. How did you manage to get that placed so close to the, to the, to the boat exhibit? Because mm -hmm. I think, I mean, I mean, this is, I think, in some ways, I don't know if that was your attention, but it's uh, it's a way to sort of make people aware mm -hmm. that there's this other industry that mm -hmm. would also be better served mm -hmm. as like a fixture of the past mm -hmm. um, because it's I mean it brings with it you know a different number of problems. Obviously, yeah. the pearl diving, but mm -hmm. I, thought, I was wondering if that was sort of what you were thinking to sort of place them next to one another to draw the connection for people. Of course, uh, that was the whole intention, and uh, it was a lucky accident. Uh, I had a few spots to choose from and and sometimes the selection is super random in these places and uh, they said oh there's this spot in the heritage village but I don't think you want it I said, yeah, maybe it's interesting for me <laughs> give me that spot please <laughs> I mean it was the perfect location it will never be as perfect and uh, it's, it's also very sad because they said it was going to be permanently there 
And this is a permanent heritage village, heritage area. Obviously, if it's heritage, it doesn't change, right? But uh, a year and a half later, they called me and they said, you know, this whole area is going to be torn down and into a construction site and you have to remove your sculpture tomorrow or we destroy it. <laughs> and they destroyed it, honestly. So it was really uh, hard for me. Um, but it's also very emblematic of, of the of the situation, you know, it's, uh, everything is replaceable and, um, yeah, and uh, culture or history or uh, story of a place is not as uh, important somehow. Um, yeah, maybe that comes from the desert itself, it's always shifting, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it, uh, I recreated it last year, so I'm very happy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sci-fi or history, how you can see it. Um, and I think it was found footage, like from nature documentary mm -hmm. or something. I was wondering where you found the other parts, for example, this text in Arab language mm -hmm. or um, those Disney-like cartoonish sequences. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I found it interesting that you draw from, from comics, which mm -hmm. I I think of media the Western culture Disney, mm -hmm. which is all also a, like a fictional enterprise, mm -hmm. or like yeah, exactly. some um, uh, industry who, who makes yeah. fictional tales, mm -hmm. which makes fictional tales, and then also these um, myths from the Arab world or the Middle East. Mm -hmm. I also thought the genie is like a, a really good idea to put it in there. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could tell a bit more about your references in this. Yes, I mean, uh, during the presentation, it was really like my inspiration uh, kind of footage, which also includes uh, Disney cartoons. It's, it's very interesting of this Disney. I mean, I, I don't know young people now, but my generation, like in the 80s, we grew up with it, I think, everywhere in the world. And um, they're based on these grim fairy tales from Germany, I guess. And um, I did an exhibition in, in Göttingen and I went there and I walked around and I thought I was in a Disney cartoon. I was in Snow White and I, I realized that it's not a made up place, that these are actually, this is German architecture <laughs> that is placed in these cartoons. It's just funny when you find out the kind of the inspiration of where these things come from. Um, a side note, but uh, the last two uh, were um, films of mine, video works. Um, uh, the first one, Behind the Sun, uh, I made it in 2013. Um, the text, with the video is actually by an amateur um, uh, photographer. Uh, his name is Adil al Yusufi, and uh, after the war in Kuwait in 1991, um, he went to the, because the, the invading army uh, basically burned all the oil fields as this kind of act of final vengeance before they leave. So th it was burning everywhere and um, it really looked like hell, like the sky was black, it was raining black rain. And as a child you have no concept of, I was seven years old, I had no concept of of if this is good or bad, or you know, it's an ecological disaster. I, you know, I, everything is a cartoon, like you say. <laughs> um, so I, I thought it was amazing. I thought it was sublime. Like it was like, oh, this is what hell was like in the Quran. This is what they told us it looks like. And you know, I'm gonna tell all my friends. You know, um, so that's what I thought, and I wanted to recreate this uh, sublime feeling about destruction. You know, it's 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 destruction, but it's somehow beautiful. And uh, yeah, so I coupled it with these um, texts from, they're actually from TV programs on Kuwait television that stopped airing uh, in the mid 90s, I would say. They were uh, inserts in between programs where they would have uh, images of waterfalls and mountains and bees and uh, just beautiful natural things. And they would say very interesting kind of poetry about uh, you know the, the wonders of God you know 
Um, so, uh, I th and it was this very orgasmic, deep voice <laughs> that, you know, sometimes when I was talking to me, I thought it was, you know, the divine himself. <laughs> um, so I really missed those because um, it's disappeared, this kind of idea about religion. Everybody thinks religion is a constant, it's never changing, but it changes so quickly. And, uh, you know, Islam isn't what it used to be 30 years ago, it wasn't used to be 60 years ago, it's every time it's changing. So, um, I think I, I missed that voice. And uh, so I, I cut up 20 different episodes and created a single poem out of them. And uh, it's also the same in the second work, uh, Divine Memory. It's uh, also one of these poems that I sliced up. Um, so I'm creating a different story from this. Um, trying to kind of remove also the references, direct references to religion and just use the more abstract parts that you know, sometimes they would talk about the moon or or, you know, the sun, or just atoms, and strange things. I, I just thought they were beautiful and interesting. It, it's about also disappearing images and disappearing sounds. Because the image of the war in Kuwait is uh, long lost history, not a lot of people remember it, including Kuwaitis. <laughs> they want to forget it, it's like an embarrassing thing in the past. And, uh, and the, this kind of concept of holistic religion has also disappeared. So I wanted to put those things together and see what to do with that. Yes. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I, I thought the color grading in Divine Memory was really interesting. I was wondering if, um, did you make Divine Memory first or did you make um, the no, no, the, first? Uh, the Behind the Sun was first, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. because I was wondering if um, if you purposefully drew, because the, the dance is obviously green, mm -hmm. um, but there were also these images of these octopi were also very much mm -hmm. green, you know, mm -hmm. green and purple. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if that was like a deliberate uh, sort yes. of callback to the earlier piece of art. Yes. Uh, and also if you picked purple, I mean, I think green is very ghostly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, but, um, but I was also wondering if you picked purple because it was a very uh, suggested to be divine color, or if there was any other sort of association there for you? You know everything. <laughs> um, purple is a really important part of my work. I use it as a you know, paint, like entire purple rooms, purple sculptures. It's a big part of my work. Um, because it's actually the color that keeps popping up in between the color schemes of pearls and oil. And I was really trying to kind of study this color. Um, and, and purple was really something I landed on. Uh, and then actually, a, a couple of years after I was using it quite heavily, uh, I discovered that purple is the color of bad luck in the oil industry. <laughs> Because in, in the oil rigs, when red is the danger alarm, and purple means it's going to explode, you know, you have to run now. So it's bad luck to wear anything that's purple, like a tie or anything. And I just found that so interesting. I was, I was using this just as a, a kind of aesthetic uh, interest in, in this color scheme, and then it became something else. Um, so yeah. Um, I'm really interested in purple. Also, it's, um, the history of purple is, is quite interesting because it, it used to be, in ancient times, very difficult to extract. Uh, it was first found in Lebanon and Phoenicia at that time, where they um, had to use like 40,000 of these murex seashells and extract this purple dye to make the color of one robe purple. So basically it was the color of uh, emperors or the pope or somebody like that. Um, so I thought it was interesting because it's, it, it could also be seen as the color of this oil empire, you know, the empire of oil because uh, it is an empire, it has tentacles everywhere. And so I also created this sculpture of a, a giant purple murex seashell. 
So yes, you know everything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Were you ever allowed to visit an, an, an oil refinery or? Yes, I, I did in Kuwait once. Uh, it was a controlled visit. There is one that was, it was destroyed in the war and that's the only one you're allowed to see. <laughs> so there's a lot of burned up things and, and somebody's telling you this is what happened, but you can't really go to an active one, no. In other countries, maybe yes, but not quite. Are young people working in the oil industry, in the oil fields, or is it like a, a work which is like kind of like in distance to you because everything is made by machines and you're just pushing buttons or is... Like no, it's... Uh, Kuwait is... Uh, it, most of the um, workers are uh, migrant laborers. So the local population really don't work in the fields. They have no connection to it. There are some obviously people working in the industry. They are kind of managers and bosses and things like that. But we have a terrible uh, human rights situation with the laborers. And I think this is also um, contributes to the detachment of the local population with the intricacies of this industry. Um, which is, it, when I compare it to here, it's, it's so drastically different because the coal industry was so connected to the social fabric uh, in so many ways. I mean, you can see it in the museum. Um, so I find it uh, very, uh, this kind of stark difference because the, the labor aspect is missing. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> No, no, definitely happy coincidence. I just uh, <laughs> came here to do a project and suddenly this was uh, very inspiring. <laughs> we could easily raise her interest by talking about mining. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. As soon as she mentioned that, I said, I'm coming. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree, but also, I don't know, I just think in, in Germany the way it was phased out was a bit humane, more humane than, let's say, for the United Kingdom or other places. It, it was kind of a, a gradual, um, you know, exodus, not a uh, cut like that, um, which I don't think will happen to us. I'm, I'm sure it's going to be uh, <laughs> falling off the cliff. <laughs> so I, I find it more humane, and I, I think it's, it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Oh, you said also, yeah, the folkloric aspect is a bit high, I have to say. But, um, but it was so connected here to people's daily lives in a way. It, it's, uh, it's a completely different uh, landscape. And, yeah. I think if the only way you, you can do this in the best way is the way it was done here, I think. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. What I find it really interesting um, talking about the subject of this distance to the, to the dirty work or to the material itself is that it's kind of reflecting our society or like Western societies in general. Like, um, like Karl Marx already said that you have this distant relationship to how a product yeah. is done and that makes it so divine in <coughs> this fetish character of, of goods mm -hmm. that you don't know how it's done and that makes it really mysterious. Yeah, mysterious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I mean, really, like, I think that's also what the oil symbolizes for us is this magic potion, mythical creature, you know? It's, uh, 
I mean, I'm not going to say it was all bad. Obviously, it was, uh, it's a miracle and a curse at the same time. Um, it, it, it took the country out of poverty, but, it's, um, but at the same time, it's destroying everything. And it, it's really like an alien. Sometimes I think about it like an alien that landed there. It changed everybody. It, it touched the bodies and it changed the people. And then, and then it will go away. <laughs> But it's like you said, exactly, because the product itself is so far that it becomes this mythological uh, yeah, deity or something. Um, yeah, and I actually showed the Behind the Sun, this film, um, it, in 1991 when the oil was burning in Kuwait. That was the first time I saw the oil. <laughs> And it was everywhere, it was raining oil, it was oil, like we were living in it for a year and a half. Um, so that's the first time I experienced its presence, let's say. Uh, which could be interesting because you know, war is a, is a rupture also in the, in the narrative. <laughs> Everything has changed, <laughs> yeah. Meteor has to come. <laughs> Thank you. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you.